Order, order. Owen Thompson to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Turner. I beg to move that consideration is given to the topic of consumer protection for online gaming. Firstly, I probably should declare an interest as an avid gamer myself, uh, which is largely how a, a number of these topics uh, initially at least came to, to my attention. In this debate, I would particularly like to draw attention to the protections for children, UK and international regulatory frameworks, and consider whether this ever-changing industry is regulated appropriately now and provisions that have been made to ensure the legislation can adapt to future developments and challenges. Gaming has changed a lot since my own childhood when my Super Nintendo or Amiga 1200 or playing on a friend's uh, Mega Drive and certainly now there's uh, no longer a need for the, the consoles, games or even the reams of wires that you often had coming out the back of your television. But Today's gamers often find instead that the purchase of the latest game leads to a further purchase. Um, Star Wars Battlefront, for example, where you need to you buy a season pass if you want to access the full content of the game. Uh, or that in order to ensure your character has the best weapons, equipment and experience, that you need to spend game currency, uh, which often is bought for real money. In GameTrack's 2016 survey, only 24% of respondents reported as gaming on consoles, with 24% playing on computers, 21% on smartphones, 16% on tablets, and 11% on handhelds. The new digital age we live in now has revolutionized the way we access digital content <coughs> and how and where we as consumers spend. A staggering 45% of households either own an Android or iPhone uh, and the UK app market is now worth £500 million, with half of that spent on games alone. UK consumer spending on video games in total is increasing. According to figures from the Entertainment Retailers Association, the total value of consumer sales was around £2.8 million in 2015, up 10% in the year before. Critically, the ERA also found that UK consumers spent £1.899 million 67% on digital vid video game media, it compared to just 928,000, only 33% on actual physical copies of these games. This trend is not just confined to the type of content purchased, but also where uh, customers purchase video games. Only 22% purchased last year were made in a traditional bricks and mortar retailer. This means traditional consumer protector and protections of owning actual products purchased in a transaction with a retailer do not exist in these instances. Instead, we've become a consumer slave to terms and conditions. And as larger proportion of the games industry moves towards a right to access content, in-app purchases and other digital content, it is vital the law properly protects UK consumers. The change in the industry, and particularly gaming, has been changing for some time. From a few key players in the 1990s to a swing towards small and micro-sized businesses now accounting for 95% of the UK games industry. The change in consumer demand has allowed budding and talented digital entrepreneurs to adapt quickly and the in-app purchase model now represents 76% of the revenue share of UK apps. Whilst it's right that we should of course support the growth of the business, it's vitally important uh, that we also make sure that we support sensible measures to protect our consumers. In terms of what this means to our economy, 21,000 jobs are supported by the industry across the EU, with the UK taking the largest share at 5,000. Additionally, the core UK video game sector, video games supported wholly or partly, partially in the UK, supported 12,100 full-time equivalent posts of employment, with the UK also enjoying a raft of success in the industry. In-app development in the UK is performing well internationally. Key examples include Monument Valley by Studio Us2. Two Room, produced by Fireproof Studios, was awarded the App Store iPad Game of the Year uh, and Apple's Best of 2012 lineup. And Candy Crush Saga by King has reached 500 million installations by November 2013. When considering performance in the UK, it's interesting to note that revenue per download figures, uh, the UK is best positioned in Western Europe with a potential of 47 cents per download, making the UK more profitable than Germany, United States and China. 
The international markets are crucial to the industry, <coughs> with 95% of the UK games at businesses exporting at least some of their products or services to overseas markets. On average, 45% of a UK games company's turnover is generated from international sales. This becomes a crucial point in consumer protection, where exporters and importers become the customers, where customers agree to terms they might not expect, indeed read, and where pre protections in place as you walk into your local game store uh, and make a purchase no longer exist. It took until 2015 to set out consumer rights and digital content to be set out in legislation. Whilst I'm very grateful for the progress on this and for the foresight that it was drafted to accommodate further developments, I fear that there are already inconsistencies between the good intentions of the legislation and the markets in which consumers <coughs> buy and businesses sell content. In some instances, transactions take place outside any monetary transactions, though the consumer could potentially pay dearly. In recent very popular launch of Pokemon Go, uh, a game I cannot deny uh, hasn't sometimes seen me battling in the gyms or throwing Pokeballs around, uh, there's some very interesting terms and conditions. In their data protection clause, for example, Niantic restricts users from bringing forward any legal action should data holders wish to do so. In terms of a legislative framework, main pieces of legislation directly regulating online gaming purchases is the recent Consumer Rights Act 2015. Legislation sets out the basic rules which govern how consumers buy and businesses sell digital content, including online gaming apps in the UK. However, this legislation works in terms of international agreements. For example, if an online game is purchased from outside the UK, and whether or not UK consumer protection law applies, or it's the law of a host country applicable, would depend on the exact terms of the contract entered into by the two parties, and would also depend on the buyer's own terms and conditions, which should be stipulated which jurisdiction applies. Whilst this information must be given to the consumer before the contract is entered into, it is far removed from the easier days of buying a disc or a cartridge uh, for my old uh, Super Nintendo. The Consumer Rights Act of 2015 came into force on the 1st of October 2015. And part one of the Act ch changes consumer rules around what to do if goods, services or digital content are faulty. For the first time, consumers' statutory rights and digital content have been set out in legislation <laughs> after consumers, watchdogs and the gaming industry have been calling for such clarity for many years. For the purposes of the Consumer Rights Act 2015, digital content was described as data which are produced and supplied in digital form. By way of example, this would include downloadable apps, computer games, films, e-books, computer software. However, there's another side to this consumer contract. At times we give data back and as the case uh, of widely used apps such as Pokemon, the consequences of the loss of the data can have little consequences to the data holder, but huge consequences to the consumer. Recently, the app WhatsApp, an app that allows people to have conversations, was also the center of a data opt-out controversy, whereby unless consumers read a long list of technical terms and conditions, they would automatically be allowing the transfer of some, at least, Da some data at least to Google. Whilst I and the SNP support fair regulations, I find the mass collection of behavioral this mass collection of behavioral data unnerving at the very least. When that data is collected unknowingly or unwittingly by consumers who either don't have the inclination or understanding, or, or to be honest about it, the time to read through in thoroughly long-winded terms and conditions agreement about the legality of court arbitration, then we must look at again at the legislative framework and its ability to adapt. With more and more app providers looking for access to content and looking for this to be a currency as such in a consumer contract, then that should also be an essential component of legislation that seeks to protect consumers in that market. Examining the Consumer Rights Act in further detail, I welcome attempts to rightly define it, what legislation can and should be used, and I welcome that it clearly sets out the digital content will be regulated when it's supplied for a price or it's supplied for a f free with paid goods, services or other digital content and would generally be available to consumers otherwise. But to pose a question to perhaps widen the debate further, what are we using the currency for free apps? 
particularly when we allow those apps to use our photos, favourite places, restaurants, credit cards, where we go and how we go about our lives, our most personal moments and sometimes our most precious. At what point do we draw a line and at what point do we consider that do we consider this a currency for digital content? Even in straightforward terms, the legislation does not yet appear to be working. Even after the Consumer Rights Act 2015 came into force uh, as a flagship legislation, consumers have had issues with the most straightforward of elements. For example, the game Dead Rising 2 and Off the Record had caused quite a fuss amongst the gaming community with uh, users proclaiming PlayStation UK will not refund customers who believe the product to be faulty. In the run-up to today's uh, debate, Mr. Tarr and I also was contacted by a number of people who have had similar issues with the recently launched No Man's Sky. Uh, upon research, it seems that the company's interpretation of the Consumer Rights Act varies. In this situation, a number of uh, individuals had purchased this uh, game through Sony PlayStation's online platform, and it was proved to be faulty, now trying to receive redress and a money back for the faulty product, yet Sony uh, say that this is something that they won't do because under their terms and conditions, the money back option is only available if they have not yet downloaded the content. Now, in a situation where you're purchasing content online and the only way you can access it is to download it, that does seem to go somewhat against the the uh, ambitions of the act where it comes from these terms and conditions immediately count that as uh, beyond terms. There's a particular challenge when accessing game from an online basis. To buy it, you need to own it first. And to own it, you need to download it. Frustrated users have taken to Twitter to complain that the game crashes repeatedly, promised features never materialised. Others claim that in order to request a refund, consumers are required to run through a list of troubleshooting options with customer services representative before a case is passed over to the PlayStation investigation team, who then decide if your case justifies a refund. This is an especially important aspect we must consider children. And indeed, some young children can also access di digital content at times, enter into binding consumer agreements that can have financial consequences for bill payers and the questions the role that legislation currently has to impact this. In many respects, we have several types of legislation overlapping with different regulators, and perhaps now's the time to pull these together. I thank the member for giving way and congratulate him on securing the debate. Just on the issue of children, would he agree with me that uh, we need to ensure that there is constant vigilance, particularly when companies package games in ways that are very exceptionally attractive, not just to children, but to try and pressurise their adults then to buy, to buy added on features as a result of the content of the initial product that they've purchased? Mr Thompson. I would absolutely agree with that point. I think that is one of the critical aspects here, that while I accept steps have been taken to <coughs> ensure that free apps are not necessarily advertised as free apps if there's in-game purchases, that's not going to satisfy a relatively young child who simply wants to play the full content of the game that they have downloaded or bought. And if that requires either the season pass or purchase of a digital, <coughs> uh, additional content, it would become a very difficult situation to manage the expectations of that young child, perhaps, to try and explain that, well, actually, no, this is because, and go into terms and conditions of why they, they can't have it. So, yeah, I do think that is an area that we do need to be particularly vigilant of. Thank you. Also, congratulate my honourable friend in securing this very important debate. And on, on the subject of children, is it not the case that, that quite often young children, especially very young children, won't even realise what they're doing if, they act, you know, if they're playing a game and they sign up for an in-app purchase or some kind of enhancement. Um, I met recently with the Step Change Debt Charity based in Glasgow and they had numerous stories of parents faced with outrageous bills that they had no chance of ever affording because the children were uh, uh, you know, buying uh, enhancements to the games without realising. And does he agree that as well as um, regulation, the uh, developers have to take some kind of responsibility for this? Thompson? I would entirely agree with my honourable friend. I think that's also a, a, a situation that's familiar to me and um, I'm aware of a number of people where that has happened, where, again, I accept steps have been taken and there have been uh, improvements, but there is still possible for young children, because they're playing these games online, to simply 
rack up a, a large bill without perhaps <coughs> realising what they're doing. To illustrate this further, it's worth noting the Advertising Standards Authority, which is the UK's independent regulator of advertising across all media, applies the advertising codes which are written by the committees of advertising practice, including acting on complaints and proactively checking media to take action against misleading, harmful or offensive advertisements, including media used to encourage children uh, to purchase and or download apps. The rules contained in these codes, specifically with children in mind, are designed to ensure that adverts addressed to or are not uh, addressed to, targeted directly at, or featuring children, do not contain anything that is likely to result in their physical, mental, or moral harm. When investigating a particular advert, the ASA states that the way in which children perceive and react to ads is influenced by their age, experience, and the context in which the message is delivered. It's therefore crucial that adverts children see, hear, and interact with don't confuse, mislead, or directly exhort them to make purchases. That being said, with the best will in the world, if, as I've mentioned before, if a young person is playing a game, they want to be able to access the content. If their friends are advancing faster than they are, it's likely they'll want to, regardless of any adverts, purchase further enhancements so that they can catch up with, with friends. <coughs> this is, it's not a new concern, however. In April 2013, the Office of Fair Trading launched an investigation into the ways in which online and app-based games encourage children to make purchases. It investigated whether there was a general market compliance with consumer protection law and explored whether online and app-based games included commercial practices that might be considered misleading, aggressive or otherwise unfair under the legislation. As part of that investigation, the OFT published several publications and set out a stark warning that the online games industry must improve in a specific area. In January 2015, the OFT's principles for online and app-based games clarified the OFT view of the online and app-based games industry obligations under consumer protection law. The principles focused on the way in which games were advertised to children. The OFT principles stated that consumers should be told up front about the costs associated with a game or about in-game advertising and any important information such as whether the personal data is being shared with other parties for marketing purposes. The principles also make clear that in-game payments are not authorised and should not be taken unless the payment account holder, such as a parent, has given his or her express consent and an informed consent at that. Failure to comply with the principles could risk enforcement action. In the press release that accompanied the publication of these principles, the OFT spoke of its aim to raise standards globally, uh, saying many games are produced abroad and the OFT have been leading the global debate on these issues. By working closely with international partners, the OFT has ensured that the principles are consistent with the laws of most key jurisdictions to help raise standards globally. The OFT also published guidance for parents to help make sure that children are not pressured into making in-game purchases and to reduce the risk of making unauthorised payments. Specifically, the OFT advice <coughs> suggests that parents take various actions from restricting payment to playing the game themselves to be aware of automatic updates <coughs> that may change either the game content or the terms and conditions associated with it. These are clearly sensible and uh, good advice, and I'd certainly recommend it to any parent or gamer. Uh, however, it's clear it's not always practical in the modern world uh, of, of gaming and making a point or a call requires an app. In terms of progress since then, it's encouraging that the Competition Markets Authority, who have since taken over the functions of the Competition Commission and certain consumer functions of the OFT, uh, and with an overarching responsibility for monitoring the game app sector to assess its compliance with consumer protection law. The CMA has affirmed that the OFT's principles for online and app-based games guidance However, it's important to note that the original text has been retained unamended. Therefore, it does not reflect or take into account developments in case law, legislation or practice since the original publication. I think this is a missed opportunity. In June 2015, the CMA concluded its work on the monitoring of the children's online and app-based games market. The CMA referred three online games to the Advertising Standards Authority for investigation on the basis that these games may have breached uh, the UK non-broadcast advertising code by directly encouraging children to buy, 
asked their parents to buy extra games features. And on the 26th of August 2015, the ASA announced that its ruling on both the Moshi Monsters and Bin Weevil's games breached the advertising code by putting pressure on children to buy a membership subscription. The ASA stated that the adverts in each of these games must not appear again in their current form. The third game has been referred to the equivalent Spanish advertising reg self-regulation organisation, uh, equivalent to the ASA in the UK. On the 4th of June, the CMA also published short guidance providing advice to parents and carers about the games, again prompting parents to assess purchases, but also release further information about progress overall. It stated that it worked closely with the European Commission, the International Consumer Protection and Enforcement Network, and national consumer protection authorities around the world. As a result of this collaboration, the CMA claimed that Google and Apple had made changes in particular to strengthen payment authorization settings and to ask games makers to stop describing games as free when they contain in-app purchases. These changes are designed to prevent parents being landed with unexpected bills from in-app purchases made by their children. The CMA at that point were encouraged by positive changes in business as proactive since the start of looking at the sector. However, they went on to say that <coughs> they are concerned that some games may directly encourage children to buy extra features during the game. Therefore, to, pre to present the 2015 Consumer Rights Act as legislation that can guide and help consumers protect children businesses may be at this point a little ambitious at best. In noting the very last point of the CMA's work, it cannot be without saying that we should value the work of our European partners on such matters as these. Uh, my colleagues and I in the SNP are certainly very concerned about the effect of us being taken out of the European Union could have, not only in collaboration on issues such as this, as in consumer protection, but also the value of our world-leading video games industry. Gaming is Scotland, one of Scotland's many success stories, uh, cre from creating the globally renowned Grand Theft Auto series to a whole host of other massive successes and there's a huge talent pool uh, available there who could see significant impacts as a result of the decision to leave the European Union. Scotland is in internationally recognised for innovative game development and for its groundbreaking university courses. Clive Gilman, Director of Creative Industries at Creative Scotland recently said, Scotland's games are played by millions over the world. There's no doubt that Scotland has played a hugely significant role in establishing this industry as one of the leading forms of entertainment globally. Further into the future, we must also address concerns and uncertainties with the status of uh, European-based funding. Horizon 2020 is European Commission's primary funding programme for research and innovation and the largest with a budget of 79 billion euros. It allocates funding through two-year work programmes administered by the Commission, which includes calls for tendered and interactive entertainment projects such as games. Creative Europe is administered by the European Commission with a budget of 1.46 billion euros, of which 3.4 million have been set aside for the development of new video games with a high circulation potential. In fact, in 2015, the UK was the largest beneficiary of this fund. I would certainly welcome the, any clarity the Minister could provide on the likelihood of such funding continuing for the games industry in the post-Brexit environment. Concerns have also been raised about the validity of international licences and their ability to affect and be capable, uh, compatible with EU consumer law. But the last point I wanted to touch on is an incredibly important one. In an industry driven by talent, led by talented and entrepreneurs, we would want to encourage a market that was supported by government, a market where it was fair for both consumers and businesses, and is right now being put at huge risk, particularly in Scotland, by restrictive UK immigration laws, and crucially, the post-work study visa. It's simply economic vandalism that the ability to travel, work, and study across the EU is now at risk following Brexit, and it's a further lack of judgment of the Home Secretary refuses Scotland an opportunity to take part in the trial of a new post-study work visa yeah, scheme. Yeah. Uh, an appalling missed opportunity. Uh, Mr Turner, I look forward to the response from the Minister on the issues I've raised today. Certainly it's a, a topic I think uh, we could expand uh, at endless lengths. 
Uh, and I very much hope progress can be made to recognise the, the ever-moving feast that we see uh, within the games industry uh, and the points I've highlighted today. Uh, and with that, I'll simply say, uh, game over. Yeah. 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 The question is that this House has considered consumer protection for online gaming. Um, are there any speakers? Yes, Mrs uh, Gibson. Thank you, Mr Chair. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Unlike my honourable friend, um, I myself have to confess that I am not a gamer, but I do understand the importance and reach of this industry and the challenges it poses for us in consumer protection. Because we know that online gaming has never been so popular or so important in terms of our leisure and our economy as it is now. The UK consumer spend in video games is increasing and the total value of consumer sales stands around 2.8 million in, in 2015, up 10% in the year before. And the direction of travel is clear. This industry, I hope, will continue to grow and prosper. And we know that video, games, video game consumers spend more on digital content than physical content. Um, the, the figures are quite clear about that. As been pointed out already, of particular concern is the way in which online and app-based games encourage children to make purchases. And the Office of Fair Trading has set out principles that consumers must be told up front about costs associated with a game or about, about in-game advertising and also about whether important information such as personal data is to be shared with other parties for marketing purposes. And these principles set out by the OFT further state that in-gaming payments are not authorised and should not be taken unless the payment account holder, such as the parent, has given express and informed consent. And I think those words are very important. Failure to comply, of course, can, of course, lead to enforcement action. Also set out as guidance for parents to help ensure that children are not pressured into making in-gaming purchases, thus reducing the risk of their making unauthorised payments. Despite these principles and precautions, the Competition and Markets Authority, following its monitoring of the children's online and app-based games market, it had caused to refer three online games to the Advertising Standards Authority for investigation on the basis that the advertising code may have been breached by directly encouraging children to buy or ask their parents to buy extra game features. And in August last year, two games were found to have breached the advertising code by putting pressure on children to buy a membership subscription. The Advertising Standards Authority has ruled that the adverts in these games must not appear again in their current form. And that tells us that monitoring must continue to be close and careful. The Office of Fair Trading has noted that it's imperative that these games do not pressure children to purchase and that, quote, exploiting children's inexperience, vulnerability and credulity, including, by including aggressive commercial practices, is simply not acceptable. Increasingly, we know the gaming industry is moving towards the right, right to access content, in-app purchases and other downloadable content. So we need to continue to be mindful of enshrining the protection of consumers in law. The video game sector has changed beyond recognition and it's important that the law keeps pace with this innovation and creativity in this industry and how that interacts with consumers. All sensible and practicable measures to protect consumers must be put in place and kept under review by the UK government in this fast-moving and developing technology. And we know the SNP government in Scotland will use its new, albeit very limited, consumer, po consumer powers to improve consumer rights while simultaneously working to maintain the most competitive business environment possible, which will allow this industry to continue to thrive. Funding, ba funding, base, the, sorry, the funding for this industry looks uncertain in, as far as international licences go and our ability to affect and be compatible with EU consumer law um, because this is unclear with the, uh, with the abolition of the post-study work visa as well as my colleague has already mentioned. It, puts the, the, it poses particular challenges for this industry in the post-Brexit era but I will not spend much time on that. My colleague has... Um, articulated that, those concerns extremely clearly. This is an industry in which, the cons in which consumer protection can be challenging. P 
purely but not exclusively because of the sheer speed of its innovation. However, consumer protection is something we must all be mindful of and over which we must keep a close and continuous eye. Consumers must be protected from harm whilst at the same time being empowered to make good, positive choices. This is the environment we need to create for consumers of online gaming and I'm interested to hear what the Minister will have to say about what plans the UK Government has to ensure that sufficient monitoring is taking place to make sure that we closely monitor and strike the correct balance for this thriving industry. Mr Arthas. Um, thank you Mr Turner and it is indeed our pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I rise to sum up on behalf of the SNP, but um, as we can tell by the attendance in the hall, it may be a brief experience. I'm disappointed that there aren't any more members um, to draw on their quotes to, to, to sum up the ideas from this afternoon. Um, my congratulations to my honourable member from Midlothian for securing the debate, and one of which I think is very pertinent. And I've got five and six-year-old children at home, and... Um, I mean, if there was something within consumer legislation we could do about Stampy Cat's voice at nine o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock at night, ringing out from my iPad, I'd be very grateful. But uh, nevertheless, it's uh, it's something that's um, intrinsically linked to Minecraft and Grand Theft Auto, which I'm very proud to say both were made in Scotland. And I was struck by my honourable member from Midlothian's historical tour of how. Um, digital games have improved so much over the ages. I'm of a certain vintage. You can remember my VIC-20 as a Christmas present, and I can remember my Spectrum 48, which graduated to a 48 plus. Um, had a tape which took 45 minutes to, to load the most basic games, but I thought it was the most incredible, modern, and chic thing that I'd ever had in my entire life when I received it for my Christmas. And I was surprised at, at a comment that only, and I say only, 45% of households in the UK have a smartphone. Um, clearly, there are challenges of, to people being able to afford smartphones, but it seems to me that, if not everybody, well, most people in society have them. And I was a little bit struck by that figure, which I'm sure will be exponentially increasing as time goes on. Um, Mr Turner, I am also a lawyer and chair of the APPG on Consumer Protection. And, and I've been very taken by some of the problems that we have in terms and conditions. And there's tension between terms and consumer contracts having to be fair and, of course, them having to be in the terms and conditions. And there's not perhaps the opportunity for the company to make those explicitly aware as they go through the transaction process. Um, but that still doesn't mean that it's right. And as a lawyer, I found the, 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 the phrase that um, in terms and conditions, one can prevent one from taking legal action based on that con contract to be baffling in the, in the extreme. Um, and also that there's no money back option in games if the games are not downloaded. Now, to my relatively trained legal eye, there, there is legislation already in place before the Consumer Rights Act was passed in, in consumer unfair contract terms legislation, which clearly states if there are terms in consumer contracts that create imbalance between the parties in favour of the bigger party, then it can be deemed as an unfair contract term. So it strikes me that although the consumer rights legislation perhaps consolidated some of these principles, that legislation was already in place. And that would signal to me that enforcement seems to be the problem here. Um, if there are rights that are very clearly codified, and for whatever reason consumers can't bring those grievances to a place that can fix them, then I think enforcement becomes the problem. But I'd be very interested in what the Minister would have to say in basic contract law, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Turner, apologies, um, there has to be consensus ad idem, a, a meeting of minds. It's the, the most fundamental basic principle of a contract. And if we have a situation where kids, especially, are buying online games without that meeting of minds, then I would suggest that we perhaps don't even have a contractual position to fall back on. Um, so the enforcement needs to be taken carefully, and protection of these kids, I think, would be the, at the uppermost of everyone's mind. Um, so, Mr. Turner, I'm not going to uh, take up much more of your time other than to echo the, um, the comments of both my, my colleagues, in particular the, the, the member from Midlothian who made such a detailed case, um, and I'd be very grateful if the Minister could respond in similar detail to that, and also, and I don't expect him to respond in this, but clearly we are all concerned in Scotland, having voted to remain in the European Union, we're now going to be leaving the European Union, um, and those protections that we want as a society 
um, are dropping off the edge of a cliff, and we are very concerned about it, and I echo those comments. Thank you, Mr Turner. Mr Kelvin yeah. Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Turner. Can I say, first, pleasure to serve again under your chairmanship this afternoon. I explained to the Honourable when we've just spoken, I think this does overlap somewhat with the Digital Economy Second Reading Bill, and some members will undoubtedly be there. I myself am dashing backwards and forwards between the two chambers to try to be in both as far as I can. Uh, but may I first congratulate the Honourable member, Honourable member from Midlothian for raising this debate and emphasising both the value that online gaming brings to our economy and to people's lives, but also raising concerns to put before the Minister. The, these are concerns share, there are concerns shared across the House and which have indeed been raised in questions to Ministers in recent weeks. My own friend, the Honourable Friend, the Member of Redcar, expressed her concerns about players of Pokemon Go behaving disrespectfully on religi in religious sites uh, and in, great, in, in cemeteries, while my Honourable Friend for Huddersfield asked why the government was, what the government was doing to protect children from in-game selling and promotions when playing games online. I have to say, Mr Turner, that online gaming is something about which I have no personal experience, a subculture which clearly involves many thousands of our constituents, although sadly not myself, I'm afraid. I have many other obsessions, but not that particular one. Um, I am concerned, however, that our consistents are protected from unscrupulous commercial practices and that people are not put in danger by online, online gaming, especially children. Stories of car drivers gaming while at the wheel are alarming and must surely be addressed and by stronger punitive legislation and enforcement. I have to say that I have seen many people still using their handheld mobile phones while driving, but watching a screen while driving in following an online game is a different order of responsibility and surely has to be dealt with most seriously. This does, of course, mean our police must be ever watchful and ready to take action in these situations. And recent cuts in police funding has seriously reduced police capability, especially in such offending. Laws must be strict, enforced and proper prosecutions made to ensure that these abuses and the range of other offences to which the Honourable Member for Midlothian has referred must be prevented as far as possible. On a rather separate theme, Mr Turner, I have long been concerned uh, about obsessive, compulsive and addictive behaviours and raised such matters in, 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 in Parliament on, on a number of occasions. Alcohol and drugs have been the most obvious high-profile problems and even here, as successive governments have failed to address them, even exacerbated them in some cases by their actions and inaction. But online compulsions are a more modern phenomenon and online gambling is now a major contributor to the terrible damage this causes to lives and families. But it seems to me that online gaming has a compulsive and obsessive component, at least for a minority of players, which can be dangerous both to participants and others. What is most worrying is that it is sometimes vulnerable people who are most at risk and there is recent evidence reported about this. It is time for the government to take a close look at addictions, obsessions and, com and compulsive behaviours, who is affected, what personal, social and economic damage it does they, and they give rise to. The government must take effective action to counter these dangers. I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Turner, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship again. And I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Midlothian for securing this very important debate on consumer protection and online gaming. And his gaming experience is clearly proving of enormous assistance to his day job uh, with the expertise that he brings. And uh, I welcome that expertise uh, as a member of this House and as a minister. Um, we do have a shared uh, objective of ensuring that those buying and playing video games are properly protected. And I hope that I can answer most, if not all, of the questions he's uh, put to me today as I go through the comments I I'll be making today. But I, I, I would like to start by talking about the sort of enormous value that uh, the video game sector um, has. For, for our economy and indeed for the Scottish economy because um, I know that uh, in Scotland, uh, Grand Theft Auto, Lemmings and some of the other games that the Honourable Members opposite have mentioned are some of the most uh, successful games uh, anywhere in the world and we, we are extremely pleased to see these strong clusters of games development studios that um, there are in places such as uh, Dundee and Edinburgh and we continue to help to support the growth through the UK-wide video games tax relief and our UK Games Fund. 
And I, I, I did note that, uh, and you know, the, for the importance of the Scottish economy as well, that uh, Grand Theft Auto 5, uh, developed in Edinburgh, was the fastest growing entertainment product of all time. That is an incredible achievement um, for those people in Scotland that developed that game. Um, government statistics published earlier this year also show that creative industries now contribute a staggering £84 billion a year to our economy. That's almost £10 million for every single hour. And we're very proud of our video games industry, which plays a big role in this success, not just in Scotland, but throughout the UK, blending the best of British technology, but also the best of British creativity. All around the UK, from Edinburgh, as I've mentioned, down to Brighton, we have world-class games creators producing games that are exported all over the globe. And we're working hard to build on this. Our video games tax relief, which I just mentioned, for example, is boosting production, creating cultural content and jobs, and benefiting the UK's overall economy. Government has paid out some £45 million in video games tax relief since 2014. This supported £417 million new investment in the UK by games companies, so clearly making a big impact. And video games are very popular with UK consumers, not just the Honourable Member for Midlothian. In 2015, the UK games market was worth some £4 billion. That includes £664 million on mobile gaming, up 21% on the previous year. It's very important that UK consumers can have confidence in their video games purchasing. To be clear about what they're buying and what their rights are when they actually buy them. And it's important that consumers have the information that they need about uh, video games content, particularly to ensure that children are not exposed to age-inappropriate material. And I believe um, there was a question about uh, monetary exchange for uh, consumer protection rules to apply. And I would just say this to the Honourable Gentleman to directly answer that question. The statutory rights set out in the Consumer Rights Act of 2015 he is right, do not currently um, cover content provided in exchange for data rather than money. However, the government is keeping this under review. So I hope that offers some reassurance to the Honourable Gentleman. New types of game technology and content will continue to push boundaries. It's vital that new business models and features are allowed to develop and to flourish. But meanwhile, video games developers and publishers must take their responsibilities towards consumers seriously. We have taken action, as the Honourable Members opposite pointed out, to improve the protection of consumers. For example, last year we strengthened the rights of consumers through the Consumer Rights Act 2015, setting a simple, modern framework of consumer protection. This means that for the first time, consumers have rights when they buy digital content and that includes uh, video, online video games. If a video does not conform to the contract, a consumer can get a replacement or a, or a repair, or they can get a price reduction or their money back if that's not possible, although subject to my earlier comments about if it hasn't actually purchased. The Consumer Rights Act also restricts the use of unfair terms in consumer contracts. An unfair term is defined as one which contrary to the requirements of good faith, causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations under the contract to the detriment of the consumer. This could include unfair restrictions on consumer rights or business liabilities. A term that takes away the user's right to file a lawsuit in his or her home country might be deemed unfair in this way. In any event, under EU law, an EU consumer would often be permitted to bring a claim against a trader in the consumer's home country, regardless of what is stated in the actual contract itself. If a court decides a term is unfair, it will not be binding on the consumer, and we have recently been looking more closely at the issue of terms and conditions. We know that many people do not look at T's and C's and may miss important information, and the government's exploring ways that they could be made more user-friendly for consumers. We want 
businesses and consumers to better understand each other and improve behaviours. Earlier this year, government launched a call for evidence on this theme and is now analysing the submissions that we have received. And we do plan to publish uh, the responses to that in due course. There's also been some valuable work in relation to in-app and in-game purchasing. Government welcomed the work done by the Office of Fair Trading, now Competition and Markets Authority, to set out very clearly the legal responsibilities for business, businesses in this area. The guidance they sub subsequently published for businesses, called Principles for Online and App-Based Games, is an invaluable aid for games publishers. The CMA also published helpful guidance for parents, reminding them about what they can do to prevent unexpected in-app purchases by their children, for example, by disabling in-app purchasing functions on mobile devices. I should also like to highlight the positive response of the industry to the CMA's initiative. Many video games companies worked closely with the CMA on the production of their guidance and have worked hard to promote them within the sector. We recognise there's been significant advances in digital technology and, and the gaming industry since the Data Protection Act came into force 20 years ago. The government is reviewing the current regulatory framework to ensure it's fit for purpose for the digital aid whilst providing suitable data subject rights. The Information Commissioner is the UK's independent authority responsible for administering and enforcing information rights and provides guidance and advice to individuals and organisations on, among other things, privacy considerations for application developers. The Information Commissioner has a number of tools at his or her disposal to take action against those that breach the legislation. These powers include the ability to con conduct audits, serve enforcement notices, and impose civil monetary penalties as up to half a million pounds. And I know the uh, Honourable Gentleman asked me about children's safety, so if I can just take a few moments on that. I want to stress that the government the government's commitments to help ensure younger people, consumers, are protected from uh, harmful content. We have a robust age rating and labelling regime for video games sold in physical formats such as on disc or box products as they're known in the trade. All such games must by law carry appropriate PEGI age rating if they are unsuitable for younger children. It's an offence to sell a PEGI 12, 16 or 18 rated boxed product to anyone not old enough. PEGI ratings are well recognised in the UK and across Europe and give consumers, particularly parents, the information they need to manage the content choices for, for children. For protecting children from inappropriate material in online and mobile games, which is a global market, the focus is on self-regulation by games developers, publishers and platforms. We welcome the age ratings and other content advice that the games developers and publishers are increasingly now adding to online and mobile video games. This includes the International Age Rating Coalition Initiative. This has, for example, led to PEGI ratings now being applied to all apps and games supplied through Android-powered devices and through Windows Store. Clearly, uh, Pokemon Go has been a phenomenon all over the world. It's enjoyed by many in the UK and most act responsibly whilst doing so. Um, you know, I've uh, come across people playing Pokemon Go uh, out when I'm walking the dog and indeed uh, uh, my daughter did uh, manage to get me to catch a Pokemon character uh, who I believe, although I couldn't swear to this, was called Firefang. Uh, and there are lots of also many other exotic names uh, in the Pokemon Go set if you want to go and have a look. But it is important that players abide by the law and respect their surroundings. I understand that during the summer, uh, Pokemon Go's developers, Niantic, uh, added some new warnings to the game's loading screen, for example, reminding players not to trespass and not to enter dangerous areas. Officials have contacted the game's developers to uh, discuss features of Pokemon Go and the advice that they provide to consumers in the UK. So this is a complex landscape, as I think the Honourable Gentleman set out in his opening remarks, but I believe we're doing a good job to protect legitimate businesses, enable innovation, and to keep consumers confident and safe. But I can assure all Honourable Members that we will not be complacent. We will continue to work together with the industry to adapt the landscape as 
video games market inevitably continues to develop, possibly in ways we cannot yet imagine. Mr. Owen Thompson to wind up. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I will be uh, relatively brief. I'd, I'd like to thank all uh, honourable colleagues for the contributions this afternoon. I think it is a, a very important issue. It's a, with the ever-moving feast that we do have to look at, it's critical that we do keep on top of it and keep adapting to the changes as they come. And as the Minister says, even those changes that we may yet not be able to, to yet predict. Um, I am encouraged um, by the, the, the response uh, from the government benches um, and a clear demonstration there is no complacency. I, I, I do welcome that and uh, I think that's certainly something that uh, all colleagues will be uh, reassured on uh, with the, the steps that have been taken to continue to, to monitor and, and to look forward. Um, certainly since becoming MP I've not quite been able to, to game quite as much as I, I might like to or, 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 or was used to. Um, but if the minister does keep at it, he might catch a Pikachu one of these days and uh, become a, a Pokemon master. But, uh, again, thank members and Mr Turner. Thank you for your, your chairmanship this afternoon. The question is that this House has considered consumer protection for online games.